Good afternoon and welcome. Um, today marks the uh, last uh, seminar of our very successful SME series that's been brought to you this year. Uh, we've had uh, an overwhelming level of support from our clients this year for the series, uh, and we're certainly looking forward to putting it on again place of the top four issues next year. The uh, topic uh, of this afternoon's uh, talk, no doubt many of you have come in today to uh, escape conditions outside on this uh, day, is how to handle this conduct and poor performance in the workplace. Um, just before I get underway, um, I will be talking in terms of um, the, from the perspective of the employer, tips, traps, um, and uh, comments from our experience of assisting employers in relation to dealing with these issues. Um, the focus, of course, is the federal workplace laws, um, because they, of course, govern the private sector uh, in South Australia. Um, my talk will discuss, naturally, the interaction between disciplinary action, whether that's related to um, performance or conduct report um, in the context of the most common applications that might be brought to challenge a dismissal, um, being the you know, dismissal application. Also touch upon general protection applications at the end of my discussion today. Um, I'm happy to uh, take any questions during the talk or at, at the end. Um, in terms of the topics, what I'll be talking about today are the disciplinary options, reasons for dismissal, performance and conduct issues, uh, as well as some recent developments, uh, including the recent uh, High Court decision in Qantas. Um, in terms of the disciplinary options, um, an employer has a range of disciplinary options uh, when it's considering conduct or performance issues. Um, they include those on the slide here uh, that range from counselling, warning, uh, suspension, and of course, dismissal. In terms of the uh, reasons for dismissal, um, an employer needs to give consideration before it can be dismissed as to the actual basis for dismissal. I put up here the four main bases of dismissal. Uh, that is performance and conduct, which we're talking about today. Um, capacity, which in our experience is becoming more of an issue for employers who have an aging workforce, um, and redundancy. Um, if it's a reason outside of those, then it could be found to be capricious or unlawful. Um, okay, so um, I'm just going to talk about dismissal um, for a moment. The, and I'll do that in the context of performance management to begin with. So if the purpose of performance management is to help a business maximise its productivity by enabling employees to perform to their potential. The secondary purpose for an employer, of course, is that its performance management is an integral part of any defence to any adverse actions taken against the employee, which is not meeting the standards of the business. Um, as I've said, the most common type of claim that might be brought when in response to the adverse action which consists of dismissal is an unfair dismissal application. The numbers relating to unfair dismissal application are interesting though, 80% of such applications are settled at conciliation, being the first stage of the commission process. 88% um, of those applications that do not settle at conciliation are dismissed either for a jurisdictional reason or at the conclusion of the trial stage of the commission process. Uh, and only some 12 applications are eventually successful. 9% uh, of those compensation is ordered as a remedy. And interestingly, just under half of compensation orders less than $10,000. Um, I'm thinking most sobering uh, figures is that only in 1% of cases uh, is reinstatement actually ordered by 
Commission. Um, other common claims where a decision to dismiss is taken are uh, general protections, discrimination, and workers' compensation. And in our experience, certainly in terms of a trend, probably reflective of the figures in relation to unfair dismissal applications, what we tend to find is quite often you're facing a workers' compensation claim uh, stress in relation to the disciplinary process. Uh, so there's an allegation there that the disciplinary process has uh, caused a psychiatric illness and a claim has been brought. Um, I can't help but think that one of the reasons for that is that um, these figures uh, in relation to other physical applications uh, aren't that fantastic and uh, workers are considering uh, other options. In terms of the unfair dismissal uh, jurisdiction, um, this of course is found in the Fair Work Act um, and the objects of the provisions include to establish a framework for dealing with dismissals, balancing the needs of business and employees, uh, ensuring that procedures are set up for the jurisdiction that are quick, flexible and informal. Um, and the objects also provide that reinstatement is to be the primary remedy where there's a finding that the dismissal is unfair. An aim of these provisions is to achieve a fair go all round. To be able to seek an unfair dismissal uh, remedy, a dismissed employee must have been employed for what's called a minimum employment period. Um, that is uh, 12 months for a small business and six months um, for all other businesses. Um, where an employee has not satisfied that uh, minimum employment period, they may well be looking at other options. Common law claim yeah, is an option, though not, not one that's commonly pursued. Uh, our experience is that where an employee hasn't satisfied that minimum employment period, the go to application that's sought uh, is a general protection application. So, certainly for employees who haven't satisfied that period, that's where we tend to find the claims are brought, uh, or as uh, indicated, a workers' compensation claim. Um, other, exclu uh, other exclusions apply. Uh, including that where employees are earning uh, above the high income threshold um, or because of the completion of a, a fixed term contract. Um, the uh, criteria for determination about whether a dismissal is unfair is dealt with in the Act, uh, and, the, and the Commission must be satisfied of a number of things, um, including that the former employer has initiated the dismissal. Um, so it can't obviously be a, a resignation, that the dismissal was harsh, uh, unjust or unreasonable. It wasn't a case of a genuine redundancy. Um, and there are also some provisions which include a specific uh, reference to exclude demotions in certain circumstances. The unfair dismissal remedy was first provided for in federal workplace law in 1993. Prior to that time, the state jurisdiction dealt with such applications. The Act identifies a list of considerations <clears throat> that the Commission is required to consider to determine whether a dismissal is unfair, unjust or unreasonable. And the list of uh, considerations, uh, which is relevant when we need to consider performance management and management of conduct issues, falls into three categories. The first is a valid reason. But that is whether there was a valid reason for the dismissal related to the person's capacity or conduct. And secondly, procedural issues, uh, that is whether the person was given an opportunity to respond to any reason related to their capacity or conduct, any unreasonable refusal by the employer to allow the person to have a support person present, uh, where the dismissal related to unsatisfactory performance, whether the person had been warned about that satisfactory performance before the dismissal. Um, and thirdly, uh, the Commission may consider any matter that it considers to be relevant in the circumstances. Um, in the past, the Commission has emphasised such matters as compliance with policies and procedures, um, as well as um, differential treatment between employees in considering other matters that it considers to be relevant. Um, turning firstly to the issue of whether or not there's a valid reason, 
a finding of a valid reason remains of considerable importance when an employer is defending an unfair dismissal claim. Um, in general, as has been indicated, that there are four main reasons that an employer might justify uh, a dismissal on. Those being unsatisfactory performance, misconduct, incapacity, or operational requirements. Um, turning now to the uh, issue of performance, the most common reason uh, that an employment relationship comes to an end uh, is that an employee's performance does not match the expectations of the employer. Um, turning now to the to the nature of the role. The, the ease of an employer to establish a valid reason for a performance-based dismissal will depend on the nature of the employee's role. Um, I must say, I've always felt some degree of sympathy for a salesperson uh, whose performance, when poor, is clear because they've not met a budget. Um, I think what we deal with in 2023 in terms of performance management is much more subjective criteria than that, though. Um, we are dealing with situations where employees will often have a respond response for any performance issues that are raised. Um, and particularly as people are more and more working together as teams, uh, it makes it much more difficult for an employer to rely upon their role to determine uh, whether or not they're meeting their performance in their role. A tip in terms of managing performance and conduct <coughs> is to is to have in place an appropriate structure, uh, including documents directed towards managing issues that arise regarding employees' performance or conduct. Um, the days of dealing with performance in, in an informal manner are over. Um, it's pretty clear that um, as an employer, if you're if you're managing performance or conduct issues, that that needs to be done in writing. Uh, the Fair Work Ombudsman has produced some helpful template documents uh, in relation to performance management, um, including those directed towards uh, underperformance meeting plans uh, and, and performance improvement plans. Sorry, we make those yeah, That's from the Fair Work Ombudsman. So you get them from their website. The uh, underperformance meeting plan is directed towards raising performance or conduct so, issue or issues. Um, and the performance improvement plan is directed towards an employee who's not meeting the required standards. Um, and these plans assist to identify the performance or conduct that needs to be improved, establishing timeframes within which that uh, improvement is expected to take place, and possible consequences if, if the performance does not improve. Um, one of the things I, I certainly found in my experience is that quite often employers will uh, contact uh, advisors for advice in relation to performance management. Um, and uh, a, a typical conversation might go something along the lines of when we've got an employee who's got a performance issue, um, I have a standard list of questions I ask. One of the first is how long has the employee been there for? And often the response might be 10 years. Um, the next question is to ask whether you've been raised any performance issues with them in the past. And quite often, commonly, and surprisingly, the answer to that is no. Um, and there's a desire to deal with this as quickly as possible. Um, one of the observations I'd make is that it's not necessarily appropriate to move that person straight onto a performance improvement plan. Um, in that situation, you might want to consider whether something more appropriate like an underperformance meeting plan or counselling is, is more appropriate than a performance improvement plan. And certainly there have been some recent decisions out of the Fair Work Commission uh, which, have, uh, which have indicated that employees need to be careful about moving straight to something like a performance improvement plan in circumstances where there's been a lack of really uh, counselling or discussion about employees' performance that they've been employed for some time. <laughs> And you're moving straight to a pit, uh, which uh, the commission has suggested is not appropriate HR management. Um, in terms of uh, one of the issues in terms of performance management, um, what you can pick up from the unfair dismissal provisions is that there's some key procedural requirements in the context of performance management. 
um, these include the opportunity to respond to concerns about performance, um, an opportunity to improve that performance, and the provision of warnings, including a final warning, if performance is not a required standard. In terms of warnings, um, some tips uh, in relation to warnings um, from the decisions of the Fair Work Commission. Um, I, I think it's fair to say it's always preferable for it to be in writing. Um, it, even if the warning is provided initially orally. So there's nothing wrong with giving an oral warning um, that's contemporaneous to the conduct uh, or the performance issue as the case may be. Um, but certainly the recommendation is that um, you, you put these in writing. Um, I can't tell you the amount of cases I've been involved in where uh, warnings were given on an oral basis uh, and uh, predictable happens that is when it gets to the trial of the matter <laughs> that uh, there's a complete denial uh, of any warning uh, or um, the interpretation of the warning is different um, to what the final example made of the position is that a warning was given and that as part of that warning uh, it was indicated that there are employment issues. Um, and of course, you find out in cross examination that that's not the case. Um, uh, a helpful tip uh, in terms of performance management and documented performance management is that wherever possible, it's helpful to be able to link your requirements, that is, the employer's requirements, to either a job description uh, or a policy that you see from the client. Uh, and that's particularly helpful. Um, the requirements of the policy should be reasonable um, and, and the content of the policy should be communicated effectively and it should be comparable treatment. Um, an employer that has a policy with reasonable standards of which the employee is aware can regularly underpin a valid termination. So the Commission won't generally interfere um, if there's a logic behind it and you can see there's a linkage between the performance and a job description or a policy. Um, as is said in, in the case of uh, an example of that is the matter of Woodson, uh, which was a matter that was dealt with by the Fair Work Commission. In terms of final warnings, um, the same principles of procedural fairness apply equally to, to final warnings. They should have a deadline and time frame and should set out corrective action uh, as required. Um, most importantly, uh, the final warning should warn the employer in the absence of improvement to the required standard that their employment may be dismissed by the employer. Um, I've always found it helpful in those final warnings to reference prior warnings and issues. Um, quite often you'll see a final warning that just talks about one incident um, and that's the basis of the final warning, at least on the surface that appears to be the case. Um, I think it's particularly helpful um, particularly if you know that the uh, decisions, the, a possible decision in the future to terminate is likely to be challenged. So, as you set out the background of how you've got to where it is you are, um, and, and uh, so that might be uh, a, a period, say, three or six months where there's been a series of warnings or warnings that have arisen, setting that background out and then setting out the reason for the final. Um, Bear in mind that it could be relied upon in terms of events that uh, are just for application uh, in the future. Um, another strategy I've, I've found particularly useful, I've used this um, on, on several occasions in the past, is to, when making the decision following a final warning, to actually give an internal right of appeal. Um, and uh, I found as a strategy that's actually worked quite well where uh, employees have chosen to use that internal right of appeal rather than bring an unfair dismissal application um, and have accepted um, on those occasions the, the, the final decision made by the person who uh, has uh, dealt with the appeal. Of course, this will only work if you're a meeting or larger company where there's an, uh, an ability to have somebody who makes a decision to terminate and have somebody senior who is in a position to hear that right of appeal. Um, I, I think you'll find that that's something you should also regards um, 
perhaps we've, we've done uh, very well uh, in terms of a, a process of ensuring procedural fairness to the dismissed employee. Uh, admittedly, it happens, of course, after the dismissal itself. Nevertheless, though, it's something the Commission can, can take into account. Uh, in terms of uh, conduct, um, uh, conduct can, of course, separate performance uh, be used at, uh, as a basis for dismissal of the employee. Um, in terms of procedural fairness, and, and procedural fairness applies equally to conduct and such performance, a number of issues may arise when the employer is seeking to comply with procedural fairness obligations. Um, when considering conduct issues. And um, common issues that, that can arise. Um, in practice, the correspondence provided to participants, uh, particularly an alleged perpetrator during investigation about an employee's conduct uh, is important. An employer should take care to carefully draft allegations of misconduct, as they can sometimes lead to a presumption or inference that the employer has already made a decision about the misconduct. Um, I've certainly found in my experience that um, when reviewing letters on behalf of uh, my uh, employer clients that um, they often forget when putting a letter of allegations that that is exactly what they are, they're allegations. Um, so what that means is that uh, you can't Put allegations to somebody along the lines of um, you did this or you did that, um, referring to the common question, because that language is uh, assuming that the conduct has taken place. Um, so what what you need to put is the allegation. Uh, that is, uh, we allege that this happened or we allege that that happened or something similar. Um, and in that way, you're actually putting the allegation rather than making assumptions uh, about whether or not particular action uh, took place. Um, even when you're doing, dealing with uh, something like financial records, uh, where there might be alleged theft, uh, you can ask for explanations uh, directing uh, an employee's attention to records or other documents that you might have in your position. Um, bias may also be presumed if, for example, a superior of the person conducting uh, an investigation, if that's necessary, they've already expressed adverse views about um, the alleged perpetrator. Um, an employer needs to give appropriate consideration to this issue, in particular before it appoints an investigator to conduct an investigation into uh, an employee's conduct. Um, an employee will often seek further details of allegations after they're put to them by an investigator. Um, this is often used as a tactic to delay the investigation, and the allegation should contain sufficient detail to enable the alleged perpetrator to understand its nature. In addition, allegations should identify the rule or policy which the accused is alleged to have breached. Um, this means, for example, where an employee's conduct is said to have breached a policy, a term of the contract or enterprise agreement or some other relevant protocol, then that policy provisional protocol ought to be clearly indicated in the allegation. Uh, and I must say, again, that's something I frequently find is not the case. Um, and it's, it's certainly a question that uh, if there is an unfair dismissal application, uh, it's more than likely that you can have a commissioner at some stage ask the question as to what it is it, it, that the employer is alleged to have breached. Um, sometimes um, there will be cases where there is not a policy that's directed towards the conduct. Um, so, for instance, uh, if you talk about a fraud for a moment um, and uh, somebody has stolen some money, you probably don't have a policy that says don't engage in a fraud, such as mm. stealing money. <clears throat> so people won't generally have a policy of that nature. Um, in that situation, uh, what you're likely to be relying upon is something like the obligation of good faith which is an implied obligation in all contracts. Um, but you should set that out uh, in, in, the, in the letter itself. Um, fraud is probably not the best example because that's pretty obvious that what, what you're doing is going to be a breach of your contract. But I certainly make, provide that example. 
Um, another frequent request for an employee under investigation is to request to see the actual written complaint about their conduct. Um, and I think certainly uh, in the last few years, um, that's become a, a greater trend. Um, no obligation rests on an employer to do so, that is to provide the statement. The, the obligation is to provide sufficient particulars of the allegations raised in the complaint during the course of the investigation. And excuse me, in particular, um, in the letter of allegations that provided to the employee. Um, it needs, you, you need to ensure, of course, that when you are dealing with um, putting allegations from a complaint document, that that document is consistent with the allegations that you put. Um, another tip I make is I quite often see a difference between the complaint and the allegations. Quite often, an employer will feel the need um, to gild the lily somewhat in terms of the, the allegations that are put. Um, that's certainly not necessary, and they do need to be consistent with the complaint because whilst it is the case um, that you've got no obligation during the investigation of the allegation stage to provide the complaint, if the matter does get challenged and you're in a, in a court or a commission or elsewhere, um, you're going to have obligations of discovery. Uh, those obligations are directed towards relevant documents, um, and if you can uh, be assured that somebody who's been accused of something and is challenging the decision to dismiss them um, is going to be seeking that complaint, and you're likely to have to provide that complaint because it's not a document. So. Um, no, no right exists um, for an employee to cross-examine or directly challenge the evidence that employees have made a complaint or other witnesses in support of that complaint. So that, that's not a right that um, alleged perpetrators would have, but might be something you come under pressure to provide. Um, the employee should have a, an opportunity to respond to the allegations that have been put during the investigation, which is often afforded as an interview by the investigator. Generally, it is appropriate to invite an employee to be represented at the interview, conducted during the investigation, where the potential exists that their employment could be terminated by the employer. Um, so if you're, if you're conducting an investigation, um, and generally speaking, if you're conducting an investigation is a serious matter, um, so it's appropriate in that situation, in my view, to give them the opportunity to have a support person in attendance at that. Um, lower level investigations where uh, you might describe them as truly uh, fact finding missions where you're not expecting to take disciplinary action against the perpetrator. Uh, that, that requirement, to my mind, doesn't exist. Um, a, a breach of such requirement would not be looked at quite favourably in the investigation process. Um, in terms of uh, possible approaches uh, to, uh, to uh, misconduct issues, um, my experience is that the commissioners will often look favourably upon uh, the conduct of an investigation if it's been carried out by an employer in relation to the issues. Um, a sound approach to the preparation of a report by the investigator with recommendations which is provided to a different manager who makes the final decision as to whether disciplinary action is appropriate and the form of such action, uh, including up to termination of employment. At the conclusion of the investigations, the findings made by investigator will be relevant and are often given some weight particularly if any written report is soundly based by the Commission in you know, as well. A decision may then be made by the decision maker that disciplinary action after determination, depending on the circumstances. Um, the reason will obviously the reason for the termination will obviously need to be provided by the employee to dismiss the employee, and that will comply with the dismissal requirements. Um, in terms of uh, dismissal for misconduct, um, there is a regulation um, in the Fair Work Regulations 107 um, that's been inserted, which provides clarification as to the circumstances that 
uh, justify dismissal for misconduct. Um, and from that, it's clear that two conditions must be satisfied in order to justify a dismissal for misconduct. Um, firstly, there must be a breach by the employee of the terms of the contract or a demonstrated intention not to be bound by those terms. And secondly, that the conduct must be sufficiently serious to allow for summary termination. Um, if I turn now to the first issue of the breach of contract, <coughs> the employer will often seek to demonstrate a breach of contract through the contravention of a workplace policy. Um, and uh, I thought it's helpful to talk about a decision and, and how that can work in this case, not work. Um, generally speaking, accessing or using a pornography at work or using a, a work computer for the same purpose will amount to a valid reason for termination of employment. And whether that, that's the case, whether you're responding to an unfair special application or general protections application. Um, a commission decision of a Sparta insurance brokers, and it's quite ironic that uh, this organisation was called Sparta insurance brokers, serves as a warning for all employees about the importance of having a policy in place. Um, in this case, that prohibits um, the uh, accessing and use of pornography. Um, the, the facts were that, that uh, an employee dismissed the employee's problematic conduct, including downloading and storing hardcore pornography, um, including uh, images and video of itself performing sex acts on work equipment. Um, so I've got to pause there and say, <laughs> what were you thinking? Um, not quite sure right, why yeah. you'd save the evidence on your work. Did, did you have to sit through all this <laughs> to check on your <laughs> <laughs> So, so it's, it's, it's a highly unusual case. The misconduct would seem on the face of it to be well and truly serious enough to warrant instant dismissal. However, the Commission found the dismissal was unfair. Interesting. The Commission found that although downloading hardcore pornography onto work equipment, either during or after work hours, would ordinarily amount to misconduct warranting the discipline of dismissal of a worker, I found that in this case it did not represent a valid reason why because the employer had not communicated any policy about the use of its equipment being confined to work-related activity. <laughs> there was some contested evidence that the directors may have also participated in accessing town mining <laughs> <laughs> Not really that smart. And the employee had only downloaded pornography on three occasions. I'm not quite sure the relevant. <laughs> <laughs> Um, That's right, under three, yeah, five yeah. minutes. Nevertheless, That's normal behavior. nevertheless, a clear takeaway from this decision is the need to have in place a policy about what is acceptable use of work equipment that everyone, in this case, including the directors, complies with in the workplace. Um, now, um, that case is equally applicable to any other policy or requirement that, as an employee, you wish to enforce. Um, and then rely upon in the terms of either performance management or conduct issues as the case uh, in this here. Um, harshness of the decision. Um, now, this is relevant uh, in the context of unfair dismissal applications. It's not a relevant consideration in relation to, to common law claims where the focus is on the legal uh, aspects of the dismissal. Um, so, what a commission can do in the context of an unfair dismissal. Uh, cases not only look at whether or not it was a lawful dismissal, but also the harshness of that decision. Um, this is this is an area where uh, employees have had some success uh, in recent times in challenging the dismissal. Um, and, and I make this point uh, through a, a decision of uh, Gill and Jetstar. Uh, in this particular place, uh, case, um, the employee Gill was employed by Jetstar as a licensed aircraft maintenance engineer, and during a particular shift, he drove a tow tug on a public road to a service station to get some food. Unfortunately for me to kill, the vehicle was not registered for use or permitted to be used on a public road. Um, following an investigation, 
um, Jetstar terminated uh, Mr Gill's employment for misconduct and breach of policy. The Commission accepted that Mr Gill's use of the vehicle was for a valid reason, sorry, was a valid reason for the termination of employment. So it clearly was a breach of the policy. Um, and because of that, the Commission found that there was a valid reason. So uh, Jetstar in this case has, has satisfied that particular requirement. Um, however, uh, notwithstanding that, the Commission held that Mr Gill's dismissal was unfair um, and indeed, in fact, ordered his reinstatement, which at first instance might seem somewhat harsh. In coming to this conclusion, the Commission took into account the fact that Mr Gill had not deliberately or intentionally sought to break or disregard the company's policies about safety, his long work history in the industry, an unblemished employment record with Jetstar, the financial consequences of dismissal for Mr Gill and his family, and his age and future employment prospects. Now, um, what that then led to a conclusion from the Commission's perspective um, is that though there was a valid reason for the dismissal, that it was harsh, and for that reason it was unfair. And, and the remedy they considered was appropriate for those circumstances, for his circumstances, was, was reinstate. Um, just a tip in relation to that decision and, and dealing with this issue with partners, because it, it is something that needs to be taken into account. The decision maker will generally focus on whether there was a basis for the decision to dismiss or an opportunity to respond to allegations and will ensure that that's the case and that those requirements are satisfied. But a clear tip that arises from this decision is the decision maker may also wish to consider uh, factors that um, uh, in the context of the harshness of the decision, such as the length of service of the employee. Um, and I think it's helpful in doing so um, that if that's the case, the decision maker should consider the, if, if appropriate, the personal circumstances uh, of the employee themselves. Um, and this, uh, if you put it into the letter of termination, in my experience, uh, makes the decision more robust and less likely to be able to successfully challenge um, before the uh, Commission. Uh, and I make those comments, of course, in, in the context of the majority of employees who would be able to challenge the dismissal by way of an unfair dismissal application, but rather than that group of senior executives who have moved beyond the, the high income threshold. And that wouldn't be a relevant consideration for, for that group. Um, in terms of um, recent developments in the decisions, um, a, a couple of things I just wanted to touch on in relation to this issue. Uh, one was in relation to the point of remedy, uh, the other was in relation to the recent uh, uh, high court decision involving uh, Qantas. Um, and I'm not jumping on Qantas. Uh, necessarily, uh, I know it's been a fair bit of media attention to Mr. Joyce in recent times, so I'm not, I'm not raising that case for that reason. In terms of the issue of remedy, a, a finding that a dismissal was unfair for whatever reason, whether that because there wasn't a valid reason um, or partial or some other reason, um, the Commission then needs to consider the issue of a remedy. Um, the focus was a remedy as we discussed on reinstatement. Uh, in practice though, and, and, and Mr Gill was one of the lucky ones, only 1% um, of cases lead to reinstatement. So the, the, the practical focus then when considering remedy is really compensation, um, which is addressed in um, section 392.2 of the Act. And that, much like every other aspect of the unfettered special provision sets out certain criteria that the Commission needs to consider, in this case, in relation to the issue of compensation. Um, and it provides um, uh, determining an amount for the purpose of an order under subsection 1, which is dealing with compensation. The Commission must take into account um, the circumstances of the case, including, and that sets out some criteria. The one, the one I wanted to focus on is that the remuneration that the person would have received or would have been likely to receive if the person had not been dismissed. But what would have they earned but for the dismissal? Now, certainly the battleground in my experience in unfair dismissal applications um, is around that particular subsection. 
uh, which is directed towards how much longer the dismissed employee would have remained in the employment of the employer. An employer is at risk of a substantial award of compensation if they are unable to point to a cogent reason that the employment relationship would have come to an end shortly after the dismissal in any event. This is likely to be easier for an employer who has, for instance, provided a series of warnings to an employee before a decision to dismiss. In contrast, it may be difficult for an employer who relies upon a single transgression to justify a decision to dismiss an employee from their employment. Um, and that's certainly been my experience, particularly when you're dealing with misconduct. And if you have a long-standing employee where you're relying on one act and the tribunal found that the dismissal was unfair for any reason, they're likely to face reinstatement and or a significant amount of compensation. Um, so take that into account. Um, I always uh, point this out to managers who get frustrated with having to give warnings to employees because it's a good reason to do the warning. Um, that is, it protects you not just in relation to whether there's a finding that the dismissal is unfair, but also in terms of the <coughs> compensation that might be awarded by the, by the Commission. Um, the other trend that we found in recent times um, is, of course, there's a skill shortage going on out there in Australia. And what we found in a lot of our recent cases is that uh, an employee has, after being dismissed, brought an application fairly soon after the dismissal, or not a matter of days, um, but before too long has, has found alternative employment. Um, indeed, in one such case, which we did with recently, uh, the employee uh, was able to effectively obtain a $20,000 pay rise within a short period of time um, from their dismissal because they were in the IT industry uh, where employees were fairly desperate to get hold of staff. So, is that the um, guy that downloaded all the pornography? <laughs> no, he's certainly not in the IT industry. <laughs> that guy. So, um, so um, what we found in that case is that we're able to ask inquiries about the alternative employment get some orders in relation to access to that information and, and work out what the, what the, how much more the dismissed employee would be earning from their employment with my client. So certainly when you are facing dismissal employment, um, it, it's certainly worthwhile if somebody has brought an application to consider that issue, um, you certainly write to them or the candidates in relation to seeking that information uh, because it's of course relevant um, as to level of compensation that might be afforded. That particular case to which I refer, we, we ended up stepping out after some time for a very small amount. Um, the other case that I, I wanted to discuss and finish on today was, was a decision involving Qantas. Now, this is the, the recent Qantas High Court decision that you would have all heard about in recent times. Um, and it's a decision, in my view, that, that an employee should consider when managing performance and conduct of new employees to their business. Um, Qantas has appealed to the High Court related to a general protections application um, in which the TWU, that is the union representing the workforce, successfully argued that the airline's decision to outsource the jobs of over 1,600 ground crew was, was unlawful. Now, that on the surface, um, seems an unusual decision to challenge. There was a business justification uh, for the decision. So how did Qantas get this wrong? The High Court agreed on appeal that this, I think, was the third time that this matter had come before the court. We dealt by the Federal Court before the High Court became involved in appeal. So the High Court agreed with the earlier judges that dealt with the matter that Qantas had made the adverse decision to outsource uh, the, the workforce, uh, which led to their dismissals for redundancy, that it was motivated, in part at least, to prevent this workforce from bargaining, which could have included taking industrial action in support of a new enterprise agreement. Now, 
We all know what difficulty was has had in the past in relation to barbers and industrial action, uh, and there was that famous um, decision that, that was dealt with by the Commission earlier, in which Qantas uh, stood down its entire workforce. The, the interesting aspect of this decision is that the workforce's ability to bargain and take industrial action was not an existing workplace right. At the time of Qantas's decision to outsource, the TWU and the workforce were not able to lawfully take industrial action against the airline. So how did this all happen that Qantas was found to have made this decision unlawfully? The High Court agreed with the Federal Court that Qantas had made its decision to prevent bargaining and industrial action, which prevented the workforce from exercising a workplace right that they would have in the future. Interesting decision. On this basis, the High Court rejected Qantas' appeal, finding that the airline had contravened the general protection provisions of the Fair Work Act. Now, what's the relevance of this to the, to the discussion today? Well, the effect of the Qantas decision is wide ranging with the potential for it to inspire all sorts of claims against employers who seek to prevent the exercise of future workplace rights. Now, a possible example of this is the common dismissal of probationary employees for, for performance, conduct, or other reasons shortly before the end of a six month probationary period. Now, everybody, every employer has done this at some stage. That the employer's dismissal of the probationary employees um, means that they have not satisfied the minimum employment period to enliven the unfair dismissal jurisdiction. And I guess the point I'm making here is that I'm assuming that it's a it's a larger employer where the minimum employment period is six months, and employers have traditionally coincide that with the end of the probationary period of six months. So a probationary employee could argue in a general protections application relying on the High Court decision of Qantas that the decision to dismiss them shortly before the conclusion of their probationary period prevented them from exercising their workplace right to lodge an unfair dismissal application. Employers may, in response to this decision, wish to review their probationary requirements to consider whether they wish to change these. In particular, you would expect that the main one you would focus on is whether you need to change the length of time of the probationary period from six months, which happens to coincide with the end of the minimum employment period, uh, to another period. Um, in practice, you would expect that this approach would better manage the risk of an allegation down the track that you breach the general protections applications by preventing employee from exercising a future workplace right. Watch this space. Mm -hmm. I'll leave it at that, and I'm happy to take any questions now. Yes. Then the, the need for policies, uh, which is obviously a good advice, reviewing them and retraining the team. So someone, a new team member joins, here's our policies. Three years later, they breach a policy. Yeah. It's never been re-taught, re-emphasised, retrained around that policy. Any thoughts sure. around that, please? Look, I, I think that um, it, it, uh, it, it's always a challenge <clears throat> um, to be able to keep policies up to date. It does depend a little bit on, on the policy itself. I, I, we're doing a fair bit of work um, uh, in, in relation to bullying and sexual harassment at the moment. And certainly what a lot of our clients are doing are regularly updating their policies. And retraining. And, 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 yeah. and, and providing training. And, yeah. and, and certainly that is a significant issue now because, of course, employers have got that policy to, mm -hmm. to uh, prevent that conduct from occurring in such a place. So in an example like that, my, my view about that is that you might have a, a yearly refresher as an example. Other policies, that issue doesn't arise to the same extent. 
Um, but it's, it, it's sensible practice to, to review, I can say, every, every three or so years. Um, but certainly it does depend on the, on the nature of the policy. <laughs> Having them signed by the employees at the time of starting mm -hmm. is always a good idea. But I think the other thing, the other point you're really making is, okay, what if you have somebody been there for 10 years? They sign these documents. You, you need to refresh them, which is the answer, and, and, and get policies updated, people acknowledging that. Policies. Um, I see on a lot, a lot of people, a lot of employees use computer networks to do that these days where you're acknowledging that, that you've read policies and that, that can be an efficient way in which people can acknowledge that they've read and understood policies. Yeah. The effect of um, mental health or psychiatric disorders that a, an employee may have yes. that are then impacting their performance or yeah, their sure. uh, capacity or the con their conduct. Sure. Um, well, that something I think very much you consider in terms of that hardness issue that we, we've discussed today, and that would be something that you have to take into account. I, I did deal with one, though, last week for an employer where we were discussing an employee who had engaged in some uh, inappropriate harassment on that. And the response when the allegations were put to them was not to deny the conduct, but to explain it on medical grounds. Um, and certainly in that situation, the employer's view, which I agreed with, was that the conduct was so serious that uh, a mental health explanation was going to be sufficient to justify that. Conduct. So it's not, all, it, it's not always a justification for conduct. However, employers certainly need to take that into account. Yes. In that case, or in that matter, Ben, if the employee commits to different treatment regime or medicase, is that something that then sort of... Um... Well, the, the, the nature of the conduct without going into the detail was, yep. was pretty serious, so it, it didn't matter in that in that situation. But it's certainly it, it, in a different context, such as performance management, where the performance drops off uh, following mm. a, a change in medication, that, that would obviously be something that the employer would need to consider, and certainly in relation to the issue of harshness. Yeah. Um, it may well be found to be harsh if, if a dismissal was to occur in that context. And, and I think particularly we're talking about a longer term you know, yeah. situation. Yeah. The um, conditions around being a small business or large business, particular small business may use kind of casual staff quite heavily. Yeah. For all intents and purposes, that small business is still very much a small business, albeit they may have a large number of people who work, say, three, six hours a week, whatever it may be. Um, and under the fair work definition, then become a large business. Is there anything you can, you can do in those situations? Uh, well, the, well the, the question of whether uh, you're a small business is, is simply a factual inquiry uh, in terms of the number of, uh, in terms of the number of employees that you have. Um, and if you, if you reach that threshold, then, then you go beyond being, uh, beyond being a, a small business. Um, the question of casuals is going to be uh, whether the casual is a regular and systematic casual for the uh, would account. It may well be that uh, if you've got a, a large number of casuals, that not all fit that criteria, such that they might not be counted towards determinations to put the bar Yeah. Can, I, can I be agreed? Yes, yeah. the Genstar case, and I've seen this in, in, a, in a situation in a novel. Is the employer allowed to consider, rather than dismissing, imposing a penalty of some sort? So I was involved, I was, I was involved in a business where someone stole from the business, a young yeah. fellow, and the discussion was you're now going to give a donation to Charity X to show that you've learned. Now, the, we weren't talking about dismissing him. Sure. Is that is that... In, say, the Jetstar matter, for example, if an employer says, actually, we'll take into account the fact that you may choose to give a donation to the road safety whatever organisation, going too far or...? or... No, I, I mean, that, that, that's something that you, you would be open to discuss. Um, something like that, um, you would want to agree with the employer yep. rather than close yep. on the employee. but. You, you, you might you might take something like that into consideration in terms of the penalty that's imposed. So if, if, if for instance, it was um, taking equipment home that was unauthorised or something, and that 
to a tune, so there's no loss, that would be something you take into account. Um, but certainly, in terms of what you're talking about, if there's other um, circumstances which uh, which the employer can take into account, you, you, you certainly could. I'll be a little bit careful about that in terms of particularly, uh, you say, return of money and stuff like that. Mm. Um, you, you need to be a little bit careful about that, particularly if you're if you're deducting from their wages or something mm -hmm. similar. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't encourage that in the disciplinary context because of the particular requirements now that exist under the Fair Work Act in relation to the holding of patients. Yeah. Also, do you guys act for employees as well as, in, as employers? No, no, we don't. So um, that's why I sort of started at, at the start saying that certainly the, the talk today is from the perspective of the employer. We, we uh, occasionally give advice to senior executives um, in relation to things such as their bonus arrangements and things like that, but that's uh, that's not generally the case. Mm. Yeah. What kind of business that has grown exponentially and well done. Thanks. Excellent. <laughs> but much too fast, and we're ill-equipped to cope. We have um, three full-time staff who were floundering, to say the least, before we grew so fast, and haven't been able to move. Mm -hmm. It's become so apparent to their performance, so subpar mm -hmm. but because of the um, labour shortages over the last 18 months in particular. Every opportunity, we want more money, we want more money. They're now being paid perhaps in excess of $100,000 above what would be deemed reasonable for their scope of work. Sure. Their performance is so bad, we're now looking to do a performance appraisal, which is something we have never done. We have done performance reviews when it comes time to give them more money. Sure. That's what we've called it. But as I said, we've grown so quickly yeah. and ill-equipped to do so. Do we have a right now to reel them in and say, this is your job description, even though it's retrospectively? Sure. Um, it's always difficult to do things retrospectively. Um. <laughs> and we, but there's nothing to stop you from um, <coughs> job descriptions at this at this time. Correct. Um, and indeed, uh, holding those staff to account right. in terms of those job descriptions in the future. Um, it's obviously, it's maybe obviously a bit difficult to roll out job description today and say, well, you didn't comply with that three months ago. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly for fu the future. We that's, had to upskill them. Yeah. If, if, if they've got confidence to do that. No, that's something you can certainly do. Right. We can. We can assist you with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and any <then you> help. <laughs> that wasn't any deliberate. <laughs> Wonderful, sure. thank you. Okay. Um, please ask you referenced um, uh, um, staff members becoming um, uh, unres um, what's the word? incapacitated by when you start performance yeah. managing at them. How much empathy is given to them at that particular stage? Then they inability to come into a meeting, um, missing work because they feel like they are unsure of due stress, et cetera. Sure. Et cetera. Well, that, I mean, that's something I mean, you'd obviously need to have to take into account. I, I mean, ultimately, um, if, if you start a performance improvement process and, and the employees is not able to cope with that and effectively trying to return to work, if, if that ends up being the case, it, it may well be that of a, a dismissal decision you're looking at, uh, a dismissal based on incapacity that is even delivered mm -hmm. rather, rather than performance itself. So it might change in terms of what in, in terms of what you're looking at in uh, the future. If, if the employee's not able to cope and not able to return to work uh, because of the performance management. In that situation, I mean, so, yeah. uh, is the employee entitled to draw against sick leave if they're if it's they're, dementia? They're, they're sick. Yeah, they're sick. So yeah. uh, ordinarily, uh, yes. Is there a long-term employee with significant personal leave and time? Yeah, I can. And very often they are coming with a doctor's certificate anyway, sure. so this sure. is a bit insufficient. Well, certainly, just just because the illness arises from the, the performance management, uh, they're still entitled to sick leave in that situation. It may well lead to a workers' compensation claim, um, uh, though you'd expect the insurer to look at it pretty carefully if it if it's simply risen out of the performance uh, because anything that's reasonable management action taken in a reasonable manner is not compensable under our workers' compensation. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yeah. So were you asking a question? Or? Yeah. My concern about addressing these problems is we're going to have, not too similar to that, is that uh, they're being bullied and harassed because we've suddenly got a problem with their performance after sure. all this time of tolerating it. Sure. Sure. Uh, look, uh, um, I, I, the topic today wasn't other bases for, for, for dismissal, but uh, cert certainly my experience, I'll make this general observation that um, employers tend not to want to go down performance, standards, performance management path um, because that, that can be a challenging and time consuming process, and of course, it's still subject to a challenge. So there are quite often other options that you can consider. One of those that um, seems to be a go-to path of all for employers is the redundancy program. So there may well be other options other than performance management um, if, you, if you're looking at a particular situation and, and the workforce structure needs to change because uh, of growth or whatever the reason might be. That's okay. Well, um, thank you again for participating in it.